Live streaming is on. Hello, everyone. This is Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Welcome to This Week in Bitcoin. Today is June the 12th, 2020. Strong hand, long-term thinking. Don't FOMO on all. It's Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. Unconfiscatable. I'm offended by selling. I'm also offended by Jitsi right now. No, by my internet connection because you can't see my face. Oh, no, but you'll see the other guest face. It's my internet connection's fault. I haven't done a show early in Asheville yet. And I guess the connection in Asheville just isn't very good early in the morning, or at least this week it isn't. But hey, these dudes, you're going to be able to see all their beautiful faces. Tai Zen is here. I put his name in the title just to trigger everyone. Yeah, that is, that's why I put his name in, in the title because some people just go crazy when they see his freaking name out there. All right, but the other dudes are awesome also. Has McCook is here and introducing Linear Trav. Linear Trav is a dude who's been watching my show for a while and that's who he is because here it's not about clicks. If you're just some regular dude off the street that's been watching my show, who's a really smart dude, you get to come on the show if you want to. You never know what you're going to get here. Okay, so we're, we're going to start off with uh, with Hask McCook here, a quote of his from, uh, from this week in Bitcoin. He says, globally, $8 billion, $8 billion of stimulus money has been printed every hour since COVID spending started. Uh, eight billion absor absorbs two years worth of Bitcoin supply at this price. Profound statement there. Talk about. It. So, uh, so I think the the main message there is a uh, a lot of people get lost in the size difference between a million dollars, a billion dollars, and a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars is a lot of money. It's a uh, it's in fact, it is $1,000 billion. So uh, globally, over the past, uh, not even very long, 100 days or so since COVID stimulus uh, started, uh, globally 20 trillion uh, has gone into, into money printing and, uh, and government programs. So uh, $20 trillion uh, at a Bitcoin price uh, of 10 grand, uh, uh, you know, assuming there was no such thing as, as difficulty eras and assuming there was infinite Bitcoin, uh, it's enough to sustain uh, the uh, absorbing the current supply of 6.25 uh, Bitcoin every 10 minutes at $10,000 a coin uh, for about 5,000 years. So when people say, uh, you know, Bitcoin's too expensive uh, or, you know, I'm too late to Bitcoin or Bitcoin's, you know, already big enough as it is. Uh, you know, Bitcoin really is uh, is nothing uh, in the in the scheme of, in the scheme of things uh, to the point where uh, half an hour of global stimulus uh, could carry Bitcoin for an entire year. Now that tweet is linked to below. Now I got to ask you something, Hass. You came up with this uh, statistic this week. Some people have been complaining about this week in Bitcoin. They were bored, some people. Were you bored this week? Because there wasn't uh, much price, uh, fiat price activity until yesterday, I guess. Uh, uh, l l luckily, uh, luckily for me, I've got my, uh, uh, my, my buying on, uh, on auto. So I don't, really, I don't really follow the price much, except for when people post about it and it, and it hits uh, uh, my news feed. So I've got like a... You know, just like how you automatically uh, sign up to give uh, to charity uh, every month, uh, I give my charity uh, to Bitcoin uh, every other hour. So I think uh, I think uh, I was promised a chat about Bitcoin being uh, being a charity, and we'll uh, we'll talk about that maybe a little later. Yes, we we actually we will now. Linear Trav, welcome to the show. Uh, I, I, I want to hear your take on uh, the money printing and were you bored this week? Well, I was not bored. I was in um, a beautiful cabin in Minnesota, uh, relaxing in the sun. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's why we're here, right? I mean, that's why we are in Bitcoin because of this known exponential printing uh, of the Fed. I've been 
knowledgeable of, you know, Austrian school thinking for over a decade now. And um, that's kind of exactly how they've said it's going to play out is that they're, they're going to print trillions and then maybe tens of trillions. And after that, hundreds of trillions and quadrillions, who knows when they get to that, but it's happened before. And, um, and I think that's why we have, that's why we buy Bitcoin because that insurance. Now that's why some people do it. Definitely. Now we've got, we've got a guy here who, uh, I don't think he buys Bitcoin for that reason. I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what's your take, uh, Tizen on, on the money printing and was this a boring week for you? Um, yeah, it's it's been a boring week, you know. I mean, it's the, the stock market is getting more action than, than the crypto market right now. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a trader, so so I'll trade anything that, uh, that I can see potential how to make money. Um, if, if you look at it from a philosophical perspective, you know, uh, if if you want me to talk from a trader perspective, I just trade anything. I, I really don't care as long as you know it has an opportunity to make money. But I'm gonna put that aside. I always just want to talk about the philosophical. You know, so I'm going to put on my philosopher hat, okay? So Bitcoin, th th there seems to be, you know, things coming out with, this. for example, uh, and this is just, it just really, it's just annoying. So I just want to make it clear to your audience in case they're not aware of it, you know? Like, Bitcoin solves three problems that a lot of people overlook, okay? You know, even though I don't own any Bitcoins right now, you know, because I'm a trader, but uh, from a philosoph philosophical perspective, you know, I never forget why Bitcoin was created. Bitcoin was not created to be decentralized. It was created to be censorship resistant. It was created so that it's unconfiscatable. It was created so that it's permissionless. You, you don't have to worry about anything else. Just, just If you just remember those three principles, those three basic fundamental concepts of Bitcoin, okay? It's censorship resistant which means that no one can come in there and censor you when you use it. How you use it, what you use it for, the manner in which you use it, when you use it, where you use it, nobody cares. No one's going to stop you from using it. That's why Bitcoin has value. Number two, it's, sense, uh, it's, it's permissionless. You don't need someone's permission. You don't need someone's authorization to use that network, to use that system. You can be black, white, you can be racist, you can be discriminatory, you can be brown, you can be white, you can be old, young, you can live anywhere and you can you can be on the moon. When you go to Elon Musk's you know, moon base or, or Mars base, you can still use it. There'll be a, a lag time between the transmission time, but you can still use, you don't need somebody's permission. An alien can come to earth right now and use Bitcoin without anyone's permission, okay? Number three, is it's unconfiscatable. I think it's in Argentina or Venezuela or one of those South American countries. I just tweeted out just a couple of days ago. They're talking about going in and all the rich people, they're simply gonna, just gonna confiscate everyone's money. And they're gonna do the same thing like they do in uh, in Greek uh, when they did the, the, the haircut. They just went in there and said, they're, they're trying to pass a law right now. If I get the country wrong, it's okay, you know? But uh, just remember, they can go in there and confiscate your assets, the wealth and the money that you created in your life for you, your employees, your business, your family and stuff. No one has the right to do that. No, no one has the right to do that. When, when I left Vietnam after the war between Vietnam and the U.S., you know, the reason why we had to leave was because, you know, people, the government came in and confiscated. They just came into my families. You know, we were doing OK and they came in there and they just took everything. They would just go to everybody's house and just take your assets. You got gold? Who cares? They just take it. You know, fortunately, my grandmother was street smart enough to where she required them to, to leave a receipt to show that they confiscated her property. And then like 20, 25 years later, she still kept those receipts and she demanded, you know, a, a, a reimbursement from the government. And, you know, they paid her, a, a, you know, chump change for it. But at least she got something. A lot of the other families did not ask for, you know, confiscation documents and, and so they, they could never get any type of compensation for it. But th if you think about it, these are the three things. Who cares about anything else? You know, <laughs> these are the three things that makes Bitcoin valuable and powerful. And sometimes, you know, unfortunately, you know, in Asia, they don't. I haven't met one Asian person yet, unfortunately, that understands those concepts in Asia. You know, like, like a local Asian. And that's, that's what I've been trying to spread the word over here in Asia 
is that that's the reason, you know, because in Asia, they just think, hey, man, you know, it's just, hey, man, it's just a way to make money, gamble, man, and just get your money and get out of there. Now, I do that as a trader. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. As a trader, I will do whatever, you know, in the crypto markets to make money. However, when I put my trader hat aside and I put on my philosophy hat, you know, philosophical hat, I, I, I understand why Bitcoin has value and why something like that is needed in this world, especially during this time. And I want to just uh, uh, end it with uh, um, what um, um, what um, the, the, the previous uh, uh, speaker just said, you know, um, about the large numbers, you know, and when he breaks it down to the amount of money that's being printed, you know, one thing that humans have a hard concept with is the idea of big numbers. There's a really, if, if, especially if you're a trader or you're a uh, a um, uh, a uh, trader or an investor, or you just want to big, understand big picture economics and see how these big numbers, what they really mean, billions and trillions. There's a really good book called In Numeracy. In Numeracy, and it's by a author named John Allen Paulos. It's it's probably like a you know, first or second year college level reading material, you know, but it's, it's, it's a book that explains what these large numbers means. Like when you hear about like a billion or a trillion, or what does this mean when it says millions or, or things like that? And, and the author does a really good job of breaking down illustrations similar to what, you know, our, our previous speaker just said uh, to break down. What does it mean when we say a trillion? What does it mean when somebody says a trillion or a billion or or a light year or things like that. And it's really, when I read that book, it really opened my eyes up to the, the, the scale of large numbers. Because as humans, we're so used to dealing with like one, two, three, four, five, ten. Like the biggest number we probably work with is like the, the cost of our home, which is like two or three hundred thousand dollars, you know? And that's it. It's rare that we deal in the, in the millions or the billions. And so when it, when it comes to trillions, it's like, what the hell is that? You know? So by, by having, you know, him explain, what does that mean when we have a trillion? How many bitcoins that you can buy or, or, or consume or whatever? You know, it, it's a very big eye opener. You know, so thanks for sharing that. Well, a, a trillion, a good way of looking at it is a million million. Uh, so, uh, uh, and again, that's a, a, a difficult concept, and it's good you you did uh, recommend that book and everything. I doubt, but who knows who will, who would check it out? But I mean, right now the word trillion is thrown around so much because of the government stimulus and people are totally, totally taking it for granted. And uh, it's it's lost a lot of meaning, uh, which is uh, quite unfortunate. And uh, many people uh, predict that it will lead to uh, hyperinflation in the United States. But speaking of hyperinflation, I, I wanted to jump to Hass McCook here. And uh, you you, uh, you tweeted out about Lebanon, which I, I think yes. people, have, people have forgotten about Lebanon now because – since uh, you and I were hanging out in Australia in October, that's when the crisis began in Lebanon. But apparently a lot of other things in the world have happened since then. Uh, and uh, so what's up there? What's up there? Oh, the, 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 the lira rate uh, is up. <laughs> so uh, so when, you were, when we were hanging out back in October, I think uh, it, the inflation had already started. And uh, the Lebanese lira, so the Lebanese lira uh, was pegged to the U.S. dollar for a very long time. So basically, from the end of the Lebanese civil war in the in the very early 90s, up until you know this time last year, uh, 1,500 Lebanese lira was equal to one U.S. dollar, and uh, and that was the rate. So in around August uh, last year, uh, the peg broke. So when we were hanging out in October, I think uh, the rate for the lira had increased from 1,500 up to 2,000. And uh, yesterday, uh, we hit 5,000 lira. So the lira has bounced back. So it's, it's very difficult to get, a, to get a price for the Lebanese lira because there is an official bank price and there is a street price. So yesterday, the street price hit uh, 5,000 Lebanese lira to a dollar. Uh, it's back down today to about 4,500 uh, lira. So uh, the Lebanese lira is more volatile than Bitcoin at the moment. Uh, but the uh, the official bank rate has been lifted from 1,500 lira uh, to 3,000 lira. So it's still substantially less than the, than the street price. So uh, the country has also run out of paper dollar. 
So if I have, let's say I have uh, uh, 50,000 US dollars uh, in the bank in Lebanon, I can go to the bank and they can show me on their computer screen uh, that I have a balance of 50,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, but if I want my money, uh, they'll pay me only in lira, and they'll pay me at the 3,000 lira rate. So I take my money out of the bank in lira. I take it to, to the street, go to a street exchange, and try to get some US dollar, and uh, I'll have to take a 35% haircut uh, to get my hand uh, on, some, on some paper dollar. So uh, naturally, in, in that situation, uh, the, the people get unhappy. Uh, uh, corona has been extremely convenient for the government. So in Lebanon, I think there's only been something like 800 cases of corona uh, with 20 deaths. Uh, but a good way to suppress rioting and protests is to tell people to stay home because of corona. Uh, yesterday, the people stopped caring and they uh, went up to Tripoli and burnt down one of the central bank main, main building. The armies got involved. Uh, to shut it down, and uh, people are starting to go hungry. Uh, so who knows what's going to happen to Lebanon? Uh, there's a, uh, you know, there's a, a political stalemate. Uh, uh, the IMF and the World Bank, and I think uh, the French have a have a rescue package ready to go, uh, on one stipulation that we get rid of our government. Uh, and you know, obviously, that's not going to happen. So uh, the only real hope for the Lebanese is probably more pain, uh, more hyperinflation, uh, because hyperinflation could only get uh, so high to the point where the army and the police will start getting poor. And when the army and the police can't feed their families, so I suppose that's uh, that's when things like a, like coup, uh, like, a, like a military coup uh, is an option on the table. Either way, there is probably uh, no, no positive outcome and uh, for all international you know, onlookers, uh, this is what happens uh, when uh, a government gets too deep into debt, a people get too deep into debt, and uh, uh, there is uh, corruption and, uh, and lack of structure. So you could uh, really say, in this case, uh, the state is the virus. Mm -hmm. Well, I, first of all, pound that like button for that insider information you gave us, because I know you got, you've got connections there, to, to say the least. I do want to point out, you, you talked about the complexities of getting their money out of the bank now and how it's a total ripoff, et cetera, et cetera. But you also mentioned October. Um, we've been talking about this since October. The, I, I think, I hope there's some people out there that, uh, that turn some of their worthless lira, now worthless, uh, in, into Bitcoin. I mean, People can prepare. We're, we're, this will happen in other countries, okay? This this type of scenario, it's going to happen again and again and again. And the 20 percenters out there, whatever you want to call them, I mean, they got to know that this option is on the table, that this Bitcoin option is on the table. Because, I mean, I know dudes in Venezuela that are happy as anything. Um, well, if they could get on the internet, they would tell you, but they can't now, um, that they got into, in, into Bitcoin when they did. And it, it really uh, it really saves you. So um, indeed, the situation is bad there now, but this situation was bad there in October. And there was back then there was still a chance to, to actually get some value out of your, uh, your Lira. And, uh, it, oh, and I think, don't forget, I told you it was pinned at 1500 to the dollar for a long time. Uh, so that was from 1990 until about last August, but only five years earlier than 1990, it was four lira to the dollar. Yeah. So uh, so that so that so uh, so it went from four uh, to to 1800, and then they pinned it back to 1500. So the Lebanese uh, have a long time history uh, with hyperinflation. And uh, I'm not going to, you, you can't really exactly prepare for, for hyperinflation, but they are mentally and psychologically at least uh, prepared for it, uh, you know, as they've lived it before, like, uh, 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 you know, 300% inflation, uh, you know, they've, they've had 50,000%. So hopefully it doesn't get to 50,000% because last time it did, uh, basically society collapsed, civil war ensued, and uh, the whole region 
was uh, almost uh, irreparably destabilized. Well, well, well here, here's, a, here's a general rule. If you're in a developing, uh, a so-called developing country, uh, I don't, I don't think uh, it, it, this, uh, this economic world economic environment we're in right now, I wouldn't be saving in any developing currency at all. I, I would find a way into in, into Bitcoin uh, if you could. Uh, l l let's get uh, uh, linear Trav. Any, any thoughts on inflation, uh, macro uh, stuff, anything on your end? Well, I think um, the other two guests, their experiences show that you know it, it's very painful, and I think that's what we're seeing now is the beginning stages of the money, print, um, money printing and the uh, machine go burr, right? The printer is does, does not stop. So uh, for the layman like me, it's when I hear those stories, um, it's, it's definitely eye-opening. I mean, it, it's hard to even understand that here in the States, that it could get that bad, but um, it's just knowing that it, it, it's real and it's very painful. Um, and what they're doing is, uh, yeah, the only way we can stop it is through something like Bitcoin. Um, like Tizen said, it's completely cen censorship resistant. Ah, uh, yes. Remember that, people. All right. Now, Bitcoin and Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin. And one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. But there is a company out there <laughs> that seems to uh, like to dabble into altcoins, uh, to say the least. And uh, th this week, uh, Coinbase uh, announced, uh, I think, 18 uh, new altcoins or the possibility of 18 new altcoins. And they pumped. Uh, for me, Coinbase is a private company. They can do what they want to do. A lot of people get angry at Coinbase uh, because also earlier in the week, uh, they announced they created some product that's going to help the DEA and uh, the IRS. So I'll, I'll stick with you, uh, <laughs> Linear Trav, since you're an American. What, what do you think about Coinbase in these developments? Well, I've, I've used it for a long time, and I, I got to say it's, it's been painful. Um, I, I got my money out of there a, a while ago, but to be honest, my mom still has money on Coinbase. <laughs> and I, just they just continue to disappoint. Um, I cannot believe that they are selling their users and the entire community out like this. I think that's that's an absolute outrage that they feel this is the way that this technology needs to move forward. And we've known this, that they've had an inkling of it, that they've shown to be anti-Bitcoin, but uh, this is this is just insane that they're doing that they're going this far um i i don't even know i mean it makes you think well what about my old transactions with them and they say they're not using their own users data but they have to be there's no there's no way around it um they've been the main on-ramp for bitcoin for many many years and they they might use a sleight of hand somehow to get around them saying, oh, we're using our own user's database, but they're, you know, they're fraudulent at this point, I think. It's, it's, it's insane. All right, Tizen, your thoughts on Coinbase and uh, their altcoin madness and their uh, perhaps collaborating with the government madness. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I don't think it's altcoin madness. Now, now, I'm a trader, okay? So I'm just giving you from a trader's perspective that they are a, an exchange. They're in the business of listing coins to be traded by their users, by their customers. So I prefer the exchange to just to be neutral and just list the coins that the customers want and let the customers decide and let the market decide. You know, when, when you start, you know, to, to me, crypto is about being censorship resistant. So when you start censoring a user or a business on what they can do and what they cannot do, I think that you know uh, the. Uh, I think that that's when that there's problems. Now, um, you did mention that, um, that that there was uh, uh, that you think that it's fraud or whatever. Uh, I, I don't know. I cannot comment on that because uh, I, I I've used Coinbase in the past and 
Uh, I'm not familiar with the, the fraud that you're talking about. I'm not defending them or nothing. I'm not paid by them to say that. Okay. Um, I, I cannot comment on that simply because I'm not, I'm not aware or, or aware of the fraud that you're referring to. But as far as, yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, maybe not by, by law, but you know, what is moral is not always, um, you know, what is moral is not always um, law and what is law is not always moral. So from okay. the standpoint, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you say that, hey, you know, from a moral perspective, from your personal moral perspective, you don't agree with their listing other coins or something. That, that you know, I, I can respect that. Um, I, I usually don't accuse anyone, a person or a business of fraud unless I have very clear cut evidence. You know, I've been to prison in the, Amer in the American prison system before. And, you know, I'm one of the few human beings on the planet that's actually been through a federal criminal trial and went to prison and actually still on the streets because normally people don't come back after you go through a federal criminal trial in America. So I'm very familiar with their, their, their system over there, their law enforcement system. So I would not accuse uh, someone of fraud or a business of fraud if I didn't have clear cut you know, a, a law uh, or a violation of that. You know, cause I was, I was accused, my brother and I were accused of things that we did not do. So, you know, matter of fact, President Trump signed the Justice Reform Act and it, you know, released my, my brother, my older brother from prison about three months ago. Really? So, Whoa. Yeah. Whoa! Yeah. Your, your brother. Yeah, so he, yeah wow. he, he's been in prison. He's been in prison uh, 28 years, and uh, you know, since you know, he and I went to prison together as teenagers, and he just got released, uh, uh, you know, three, three, about three months ago, thanks to you know President Trump's uh, Justice Reform Act, you know, because he signed a law that said that hey, you get you got to sentence people correctly. You can't just sentence them to just any random sentence that you want. You have to oh, sentence wait, them. Wait. So, so your your brother is free on the streets. Yeah, yeah, he's free, but he's stuck in a halfway house in Houston right now, simply because um, the um, the uh, because of the coronavirus stuff, you know, <laughs> and and also because of a bunch of mainly because of that, because you know. So Wait, have you, have you seen your brother yet? Have you have you been back? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I've not seen him. Like I talked to him on on, on you know uh, social media apps. Uh, you know, I can communicate through him. You know, um, through video and stuff. But no, I have not seen him like in person, and he has not seen me in person or anything. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy for uh, for justice. I mean, I I don't know his whole story or anything like that. I I, I probably should comment on, it, but I'm, I'm no, no, happy. No, no, no. We we got busted with a small amount of drugs, and then you know the reason why he got extra time, more time than I did, was because he got charged for using a uh, a gun that he did not have. In other words, like they charged him for using a, a firearm which he never had. Even during trial, when when the jury asked, you know, where, where is this gun that you keep talking about him using? They, they, they never produced it. Like it was never there. There, there was, they just made up a, a charge that he had, you know, uh, from when he was younger, where the case got dismissed when he was younger. And then they brought that case back and said he used it. And it was mainly because we, we, we refused to snitch on our friends and other people in the neighborhood. Cause I, I grew up in the, in the ghetto in, in, in a very ghetto black neighborhood in, in the city of Port Arthur, Texas. And we, we refused to snitch on our friends and our neighbors, you know, so they just slammed us with a bunch of time and a bunch of crap, you know, but thanks to Trump, you know, got it, um, uh, got it uh, uh, corrected. So he got released. So oh, instead of doing I, another I, seven I, years, he, I, he, he I want, Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry. I, I just want to say that this has been a, a, a unplanned beyond Bitcoin moment here, people. You never know what you're going to get. I, I uh, Tizen has quite a story here. So it, all these guys are linked to below. So please follow Tizen. And I, I as everyone can tell, I'm, I'm very surprised by this news. I, 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 uh, but okay, let, let's get back. Sorry, Tizen. Yeah. You, you no, were talking yeah. about it, the, the issue with Coinbase also is speaking of snitching, are they, what, what do you think about the, them working with the IRS and the uh, well, DEA? You know, I, I, grew, I grew up in the hood, you know, so, you know, like, you know, we have a model that says snitches get stitches, you know, that means yeah. that they get beat up and then they get cut up and they get shot and stuff, you know, and, you know, in, in this case, you know, when you use Coinbase or any exchange, they, they have access to your personal data and your personal ID and, and by law, by law, they, they, after you trade a certain amount of money, right, uh, after you go past a certain amount, by law, they have to report that to the IRS, to the Internal Revenue uh, 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 Services, the, the tax man, and to the government. So if you do that in the stock market, they, you know, the, the brokers like TD Ameritrade, like Charles Schwab, they, they report that too. So to me, if they 
report that to the government that they're just you actually want an exchange that actually follows the law and does what they're supposed to do. You know, and sometimes we forget that the crypto, when we use the crypto, it's censorship resistant, it's private, it's, you know, permissionless, and uh, and we don't need, uh, it's unconfiscatable. However, if we take our crypto and we give it to an exchange to hold on to it for us, whether to, to buy it, to sell it, to store it, whatever reason, I don't recommend you store any crypto on, a, on any exchange, but if you put it on the exchange, now you are in their jurisdiction where they have to follow the laws of their country. So we cannot blame them that. Now, if they provide software, okay, that, that's one thing. Now, we're talking about if they provide software to the government law enforcement agencies so that the law enforcement agencies can spy or, 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 or analyze your trades, your transactions and stuff to see what you're doing, right? Now, that, that's a different story. Now, that comes back to, you know, uh, it's, it's a moral issue of do you agree that that's, you know, violating your personal financial privacy or not. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to use them if, if you don't want them to interfere with your, your personal financial privacy. Like, I always recommend that people that get into crypto, especially if you're dealing with small amounts, like less than like $50,000 or so, to go through an exchange that's possible where you don't have to reveal your personal ID, your, 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 your all your personal uh, identification uh, um, uh, information, identifying information, if you don't want an exchange or, or somebody else to know what you have. You know, the, the only difference is that you, you have to pay a slightly higher price and you have to go, it takes a longer period of time. Well, you know, Ty, you Ty, I, I, got a, I got a specific question though. You're, you've talked about two kind of separate things here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clearly separate them. Coinbase is developing a product. Mm -hmm. That will allow the IRS and the DEA to study public information, just all sorts of public information. Do you think does that bother you enough to? No, end it does your not bother. With Coinbase? No, it does not bother me. I think that the problem that people have is because it's Coinbase that's doing it, and not an individual company. If Haas or myself or you or somebody else is doing that. Right. If it's an individual that has nothing to do with a cryptocurrency exchange, like that one company called, I think it's called Chain Analysis or something like that. They do yes. a similar thing. It's basically, uh, it's basically, it falls in the category of cryptocurrency forensics software. That, that's the category that it, it falls under, right? So that the, 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 the tax man and the law enforcement can use it to, you know, do their uh, uh, whatever, their tax research to see who's violating tax laws and who's violating uh, uh you know, the laws of the country, someone is going to make that. Someone is going to make that regardless if it's Coinbase or if it's chain analysis. There's going to be companies that come out and do that. And I expect more companies to come out and do that. So I don't think, I mean, that's just the market. If the market needs that type of tool, someone's going to create it. Right? Maybe right. there's a, a, a moral issue. Like it kind of eats us up the fact that, hey, you know, you're the exchange I'm using and I'm giving you my Bitcoins and now you're going to go switch on me. That's you know, what I'm saying. That, yes. That's, yeah, Ty, so that's the, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But, but if it wasn't an exchange like chain analysis, like, you know, like there's a big fuss when, when chain analysis announced that they had software to, uh, uh, and I hope I got the name correct, but there's a company out there. I think yeah. it's chain analysis or somebody that said that they can do. And then I, I talked to one of those people at, um, at one of the, 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 the uh, what do you call it? At the boxes at the, at the Texas Rangers baseball stadium in Dallas, right? Uh, I mean, in, um, in Arlington, uh, in the state of, uh, of Texas. And Skybox. that lady that yep. I talked to, she said, that she said that whatever transactions you make on Bitcoin, she says, we can find out where it goes. She says, there's no hiding. You know, she's, she says that we've done it, we've tested it. And any transactions you make, she says that we can trace it down. We may not know who well, yeah, that, that at the moment, but she says that if they make enough transactions, if you make enough transactions, she said that we can find out who it is. It's, it's a business model out there that many people find immoral and disgusting, but it's, it is out there. Chain Analysis actually announced this week that they can do it with Zcash and Dash also. I want to get Hass's take on Coinbase uh, from the Australian uh, perspective here. Yes, I probably uh, uh, agree uh, bits and pieces or maybe even in, in full 
uh, with the others. Like, I don't like Coinbase. I think their practices are extremely dubious. But, like, it is what it is. People now protesting, going out, defund the police, whatever. Just defund Coinbase. Just stop using them. If you don't like them, don't use them. Uh, because, unfortunately, like, the casino industry is, like, it's here to stay. And if it's not Coinbase that's listing these coins, it's Binance. If it's not Binance, it's Bittrex. If it's not them, it's them. Like, if you just, if you don't like them, uh, don't use them and, uh, and recommend against their use uh, to people, like, asking uh, when they're getting into Bitcoin. So, for me, when, like, and, you know, uh, uh, every kind of evangelist is unique. So, I've got the, I've got the, the saving slash donation approach. So when people ask me about Bitcoin, the first thing I tell them is make yourself a weekly budget and just start buying every week, DCA. And like now there are several companies that just provide a pure DCA experience. So, you know, if you're in America, uh, you've got Swan, uh, Cash App, River. Uh, in Australia over here, we've got like Bitteru and, and Amber. In England, you've got CoinFloor. In, in uh, continental Europe, you've got uh, uh, you know, several options popping up. Bull Bitcoin in Canada. Basically, anywhere you go now, like at least you know in the Anglosphere, uh, if you want a Bitcoin-only option, which allows you to, to, to save you know, at fixed intervals, daily, weekly, fortnightly, monthly, uh, whatever, uh, that's all available uh, to you now. Uh, at lower fees in many cases to places like Coinbase and whatnot. But if uh, if trading's your game and you know uh, altcoins are your game, uh, you know if if there's a game to be played, somebody's going to be somebody's going to make money providing a playground. Uh, so uh, I don't agree with what Coinbase does. Uh, so I just I don't use them and uh, recommend against them. Uh, and and eventually you know that. Uh, uh, you know, that uh, line of thought will either pick up steam and people will stop using Coinbase and Coinbase will go out of business. Uh, or that line of thought doesn't pick up steam and people continue to use Coinbase and, and Coinbase keeps going strong. So it's uh, uh, the nature the nature of the of the free market. So, uh, yeah, if I, don't, if I don't like something, I just won't uh, spend my money there. So, all right, um, pass. Uh, um, uh, uh, can I add something on top of what uh, um, you just said here? Yes, sure. Uh, yeah. From a philosophical yeah. perspective, I agree with what uh, um, um, you just said, with Haas, with what Haas just said. But now, as a trader, okay, I just want to share this with your audience. So, you know, the, the risk of losing your money and getting hacked and all kinds of stuff, okay, is significantly higher with a new exchange or just some random exchange. Coinbase is the biggest, not just an exchange, a crypto exchange, but the last time I checked, they had like over 12 million uh, users in, in, um, in uh, 2017. And by now, they should have even way more than that, probably over 15 million users since then, right? They are the biggest broker in America. And they are partially owned by the New York Stock Exchange. So all the rules, regulations that they have to comply with to be a legitimate broker in America, they, they are doing their best because you know the New York Stock Exchange, I think, invested like $75 million into them way back in like 2013 or 2014. So I'm saying that because if you have a large amount of money, and, and large is different for everyone, but I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say this. If you have more than like, let's just say $10,000 that you wanna put into crypto, I'm gonna say that that's one of the safest exchanges that you can use in America. Okay, and if you have access to it from Europe, or Australia, or Canada, that is by far one of the most safe, the, the safest exchange, and it has the most experience with with in the markets to, to prevent from being getting hacked, and, and they can scale, and you can buy large large quantities of crypto safely. I cannot say that about too many exchanges. There's, there's only like maybe two or three exchanges in the world that you can buy like $100,000 or $500,000 or a million dollars worth of crypto safely and know that that you're not going to get ripped off or get hacked or, or easily, okay? So I just want to put that out there so that if you have any viewers or users that say that, 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 that hear this, you know, I don't want them to think that, hey, I'm not going to use Coinbase. If you're an elderly person, you're not good with computers and stuff, 
that is probably the safest exchange in America for you to use uh, outside of like uh, that in Gemini. Okay, like we, we, I had a client that that just recently had to buy like a million dollars with the crypto. That was the only exchange that we could recommend them to buy that in America. We're not going to recommend them go to like a decentralized exchange or some exchange offshore, right? And the other thing too is that when it's time to do taxes, when when you have to 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 pay your accountant to do taxes, the more hours that your accountant has to spend to figure out what your taxes are from crypto, because most accountants don't know how to do crypto taxes. Okay, that's going to cost you a lot of money. So at, at Coinbase, they issue you a 1099 in the tax forms that you need to file your taxes in America, and and they're getting better and better at it. You know, it's not the best, but they're getting better and better at it each year, right? So that they can comply with the tax laws in America. So just having that at the end of the year, you can print it out or they, they print it out for you and then you just give it to your accountant. It, it reduces the amount of time and money that you have to pay your accountants to do taxes. Now, I understand from a philosophical perspective, there are people that don't like to pay taxes. There don't people that don't like to comply with the tax laws in their country, right? I'm just saying that for the people who are planning to comply with the tax laws and who are planning to comply with the laws of their country, and they're planning to, you know, buy a large amount. That is that in Gemini, Coinbase and Gemini are the safest exchanges, in my opinion, to use. And that's what I would personally recommend my family members, friends, and everybody to go use, just so that they don't get hacked. Because nothing is worse than getting hacked or losing your coins. You're a beginner, you lose your coins. That's it. You're gonna think this stuff is a scam. You're gonna think this stuff is a fraud. And we just lost a, a crypto user, a crypto investor, a crypto fan, a crypto supporter. And to me, it's more important to have more users and more people involved in crypto than to, to, to discriminate against certain exchanges. That's just my philosophy. Okay. Hey, Ty, I really want to jump in and get your perspective right. your, from Someone a trading view. Oh, okay. Yeah, chime in. I was just going to ask Ty, from a trading perspective, you know, but they seem to come down every single time the price spikes or drops. I mean, okay. how do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, that's another problem that they have. So we we build software for ourselves to trade. Like, like we we have the, the Typhoon portfolio manager that we've been building for the last few years. And one of the things that I've learned, you know, just building software for uh, custom software for us and our students to trade in the crypto market, you know, to be more efficient and to be able to scale our trading. One thing I've learned is that the more users that you have, there's lots of problems that you you cannot tell. Like okay. when we have the software and we have it, when, when you have so, when you're building software, you use 100 users. There's problems that you don't see. There's bugs that you don't see. And then when it gets to a million users, that is not easy. Just, just so you guys know. Right. Uh, I talked to Charles Hoskinson, you know, and he said that it, it takes about five million dollars to get the software up to a point to any software to a point where where you can have a million users. And I've confirmed this with several you know, developers that's, uh, that, that's, you know, been long time developers and they, they, they can agree that, yeah, that it's somewhere around there. You, you cannot get that, you know, 12, 15 million users without millions of dollars. And the thing is that when software bugs happen, there's things that happen that you never anticipate. You might have, you know, 15 million users, but only a million users are using it at one time simultaneously. And then all of a sudden the market goes volatile and it goes crazy and everybody's logging on and they're trying to buy or sell at the same time. And now you got five or 10 million users. It produces problems that they, they cannot, they don't see those problems until it's being used. So we, if, if, if we don't know that those problems exist until people use it, how can we fix it? You know, if they keep letting it go on for four or five, 10 years or something without fixing the problem, now that becomes a problem. But if it's the first time they've encountered that problem, right? And sometimes the thing, it, sh it shuts down because of the large volume of users happening. They may not even be able to replicate that and figure out what happened. Like a lot of the, the software bugs that we have in, in our portfolio manager uh, for us and our students to use, sometimes we have to see that bug several times, several dozen times before we finally realize, hey, what is the software bug? And then we can go in and fix it. So maybe they don't have that bug until 10 million users use it. And how often do we have that? So I'm not, like I said, guys, it sounds like I'm defending them, but I'm just sharing with you guys, you know, we have in software engineers as co-founders on cryptocurrency.market. We're building custom trading software for us and our students to use. So we, when we run into that, that's why we encourage our students to do this. If you have a large portfolio, we always recommend like having a lot of exchanges. Like I personally have probably about 30 to 40 exchanges, 
ready to go, simply so that when it's time for me to sell, I have an avenues to uh, unload uh, uh, the, 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 the coins and be able to sell it or buy it whenever I need to. So that's just just be aware of that, guys, because you got you, you talk to a lot of guys out there that only trade, you know, five, ten thousand dollars and they don't see issues with scale when large amounts of coins are being traded or they don't see the, the problems that exist when large numbers of traders are using the software at the same time. I think my problem is All right. I, uh, uh, I wanted to. Oh, yeah. Go no, ahead. Go on, Adam. No, no, no. Go on, Adam. It's all right. No, 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 no. You said I want you to I want you to say what you're going to say. Yeah, I just uh, I just don't know a lot of traders. And like I, uh, I, I try to <laughs> stop people. I try to stop people going down the road. Uh, so like for most of the exchanges I use, like I'd be happy to use a back alley exchange. Uh, simply because like my Bitcoin won't sit on the exchange for more than 15 minutes. Uh, but I, but I do understand that that's not a, it, that's not something many people do. Like uh, a lot of people still use, uh, the exchange as, as their wallet. So, uh, and Coinbase is a fantastic example of this, uh, in terms of like n number of coins in custody, uh, people, uh, you know, buy and sell on Coinbase, but also use, uh, Coinbase as, uh, as their wallet. Uh, which is another objection a lot of people in the, in the Bitcoin community have to Coinbase is just uh, uh, they're uh, they're a huge they they are a huge target. Luckily, they are they are yet to be hacked. Uh, I think I'm I'm not 100 percent sure. And uh, uh, and if it and if it only takes uh, a dozen a dozen times to spot the bug, uh, Coinbase will get it right. I think in another two occasions. Because I think uh, I think that I think they're ten for ten on uh, on on the system going down. But like uh, again, uh, I'm I'm not a I'm not a software expert. I do appreciate that a lot of money has to go into into software development. Uh, but we were talking earlier about the millions and billions and trillions. Uh, uh, if Coinbase can't invest fifty to one hundred million dollars in their platform. Like they're struggling pretty bad because they've raised at least that amount of, uh, of VC funds. So for the amount of money they've raised, you would expect uh, higher performance in, in times of like extreme uh, volatility and utilization. Uh, but again, I uh, like I'm probably not the best person to comment on this because I don't have a, like a I don't have a horse in the race. So well, let, let uh, I'm not, not American. Don't use Coinbase, and I don't trade. <laughs> Uh, All right. Well, so like, we're, we're here talking about the big boys. Coinbase is clearly a huge player, like them or hate them. Uh, I mean, we could talk about them every week, every week on this week that they have, that they're in the news, okay, in, in some form or fashion. So let's talk about someone else that's uh, as big of a, a player, and that's GBTC, Barry Silbert, Grayscale. And you could talk about them every week and people, uh, especially fans of the having and the supply have been talking about GBTC a lot because I mean, they, they might end up owning 2% of the Bitcoin out there, uh, at, at the rate things are going, uh, um, to me that, that doesn't matter, man. I, I think well, that people no, 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 no. That's okay. Yeah, no, what are you gonna say? Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. GBTC doesn't matter to you. It doesn't matter. No, 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 no. It's not GBT, it doesn't matter. Like, the pe people have this this concept. This is what's uh, I think it's like I'm not a psychologist, but I think it's called like the justice mechanism. Like, they did a test in college or, or somewhere where they, they bring two random strangers in, put a hundred dollars, you know, on the table in twenty dollar bills, and they have person A, you know, decides how much they split it, you know like 40, 60, 50, 50, 70, 30, and then 20, 80. And then they, then they tell second person B to say, hey, you decide if you guys keep that money or not. Now, neither one of them know what why they're doing it the way they are. Just like person A, you know, has to be, you know, uh, uh, split the money up into two piles, and then person B has to decide if they keep it or not. Now, they did it, and when it was like 50, 50, 100% of the time, Person B would say, yeah, we keep it. And then they walk out of the room, each of them walk, get 50 bucks. Just walk in the room, make a decision, and walk out with 50 bucks. And if person A splits it 60-40, you know, they notice that person B will, like, 
be reluctant and kind of, you know, uh, grunt a little bit, but they go ahead and agree that both people should keep it. Now, when it goes to like 70, 30, right? Person B, they were shocked that some of them said, no, we shouldn't keep it. And then when it got to 80, 20, it was even worse. The number of people that would say, no, we would, none of us should keep the money. Now think about that. You walk into a room and you get to decide, hey, should I keep the money or not? And you walk away with 20 bucks and you would say no to that. Like you didn't do anything. You had to say no to that. And I think in psychology, they call it the justice mechanism. Like it's not fair. Like that there's this innate nature in humans that we don't feel that that's fair. Okay. Even though it was... What's that right? got to do with GBTC, though, or everything you Okay, said. GBTC, it's not just GBTC. It's the amount of Bitcoin that someone has. Like, there's always this oh. thing in crypto. No, no, where... Okay, uh, I don't think people, it, it, if they control 2% of the Bitcoin, they are a big player. I mean, they're a big player yeah. in the space. Has, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you own, you know, 20, 30% of the Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be divisible to 100 uh, million Satoshis. Uh, it goes out to eight decimals. It's more than plenty. Of, of, of what do you call that, of math to accommodate, if we need a $10 trillion supply of currency, the 21 million Bitcoins, right? It's more than plenty. It goes out to eight decimal places. And most people don't realize how big that is when you go out that far. That's that's a lot of, of, of when we talk about scale, that's a vast, large number of scale. If we need a trillion dollar, $10 trillion, $100 trillion, a thousand trillion, whatever numbers that it goes up big, Bitcoin can accommodate that with no problem. Yeah, the idea that someone controls 2% or 5%, it's just, to me, it's just a, people are not, they're more, they have a justice mechanism mindset more so than anything else. You know, they think, but, oh, but, but I, I, my bigger point is, is that that Bitcoin isn't going to move, that they're, they're buying Bitcoin, they're buying Bitcoin at a rate faster than new Bitcoins being produced. That's why they keep, people keep on writing about GBTC. That they're buying it up. Who cares? Who cares? Uh, oh, who cares? That's, okay, that's what. But people who hey, look, 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 people who complain about supply, people who care about the so supply you, shock and the having and the stock the flow. You, those people. Those. People. If you complain because I own too many bitcoins, not complain you, though. You, not complain. You, 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 you're trying to censor how many bitcoins I can own. It's hey, yeah. it's a permissionless network. Yeah. It's a permissionless network. Yeah, yeah. But, not, 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 you, okay, no one's. No one's angry at them for that. People are happy that they're buying more. That that, that it's the whole stock the flow issue. That that that's that's what this is. Yeah, it, not me. I'm angry. You're angry. <laughs> you're angry. Okay. So so uh, okay. Let, let's stop. Let's linear trav. I'm not thoughts. angry. I'm not angry. Linear I'm, trav. I'm, you, you're a you're an economist or something. You said. <laughs> yeah. Nah, I mean. What, what do you what do you think about uh, that that. Uh, there's only X amount of Bitcoin being produced a week now, and uh, this one big player is buying up, buying a lot of it and taking. So there's not as much for everybody else to buy, which I think is good. Yeah, I'm, I'm not accredited by any means, um, so I can't buy it directly from them. But I understand the process, and I understand the allure of investors getting in. Um, and and actually, it's a cycle. These these investors, they sell their Bitcoin every six months for that premium, and then they buy back the GBTC. That's kind of a hidden secret that Barry won't tell you, is that that's what these users are doing. And they're making they're making that, that premium every six months, and then they're buying more, and they're continuing. I mean, I don't want to say it's a Ponzi, but I, I mean, is it good for Bitcoin? Right now, it's definitely good for the investors, that's for sure. But um, I'm not even sure people are in it for the Bitcoin. They're in it for that premium every six months, and they're selling, and they're buying back. That's it. And someday, they might not buy back. Um, uh, so I think there's a potential. Uh, I, I, for, I, I, so, so as a trader, okay, because we, 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 I don't see them using it in that manner, guys. Yeah, I'm just it's giving you trading, guys. though. It's, I'm giving you guys a trader as someone who, you know, we we help our students trade, you know, and manage seven, eight, nine figure portfolios. We're not chump change traders. Right. Okay. So yeah. I'm just telling you guys, right? If you have, let's just say, I'm gonna give you an example, okay? If you have a million dollar portfolio and you want to put five hundred thousand dollars into crypto and you have that million dollars in a retirement account, okay, you cannot just take that money out of a retirement account and go put it into crypto. People don't know that. I got you. Right. 
So you might have tax incentives. You might have tax incentives that require you to put that into, like, let's say if you have your money in America, it's called an in, uh, uh, IRA, an independent uh, individual right. retirement account. So if you want to put your money that's in an IRA into crypto, you have to go through somebody, a business or a company that owns crypto in, in, a, in a secure custodian type process, okay, so that you can put your money in there. You can't just go and buy the, the Bitcoins off of, uh, a big, uh, of Coinbase or Gemini. You can't do that. So you have to use right. that. GPC if you want to put your money into it. Yes, you have to pay a premium. Like you said, you have to pay like an extra whatever the premium is, but the tax benefits that you get from it outweigh that. That's the reason why that premium is there. But I'm saying you can buy it directly from Grayscale. You're not paying the premium when you buy it from them. You pay the premium when you buy it on the market, when you buy the market GBTC. You get my point? There's yeah, yeah. Difference. So, so the, the, the exchanges exist for a certain solution. The right. great scale you know, exists. There are people that need that. Yeah. You might say, hey, man, just go out there and buy the damn Bitcoins yourself. Like buy your million dollars worth of Bitcoins yourself. They can't. We, most guys in, in, in crypto guys, here's one thing they can't see. They can't think of scale. I'm guilty of it myself. Like, you know, in, in 2017, when I got to the point where I'm managing a multi seven figure portfolio, right? There was a lot of issues I didn't know. I, no, no, no one told me that. My mentors didn't tell me that. Hey, Ty, when you get to this size of trader, these are the things that you need to manage a, a large portfolio like that. No, no one ever told me that. I had to go figure. Me and my team had to go figure it out ourselves. And we, now we're building custom software to help to, to handle some of the scaling issues. Okay, but when when we look at some of these things that we don't like from a moral perspective, we have to keep in mind that those tools and those services and those businesses are built for a reason. For example, we have team members that, that buy into Grayscale and GBTC and all that because, because that's the only way that they can put their retirement money yeah, the retirement. into the crypto market. It's a, it's a retirement solution. It, that, yeah. That's I, I want to I want to ask uh, the Australian uh, perspective on. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on on, on GBTC and uh, the that they that they are a major player? I think it, we we can't deny that. I, I think the the only problem. I have with GBTC uh, is the like is the not your keys, not your coins uh, problem. But I do understand how like regulation and, and rules can prevent people from holding their own keys. Now the problem is when you hold two percent of the keys on behalf of other people, you know, without you know proving or having the burden of proof that you're holding them and not you know learning them out. Uh, uh, to shorters, uh, like you know, I get uneasy. So, for example, like uh, for the past month, uh, GBTC alone has been buying up 150% of the new supply. So they're buying more than is being produced. Uh, you throw Cash App on top of them; they're buying up like 25% of what's being produced. So, like. Uh, all of the new supply is being uh, swallowed up, you know, and some, uh, but the price isn't going up. So it's just, I don't know, are people really, uh, uh, you know, running out the door at this oh. price? Are there really people, you know, like uh, leaving like an exodus, like on mass in Bitcoin at this price? Like something, there's something like uh, uh, for me that's personally fishy about, all of the supply being swallowed up like with absolute oh. ease, uh, but just a, a lot of you know legacy people just just leaving. It just it doesn't make sense to me. Oh, oh, oh okay. I, I have to add something to that so that your viewers know, because because you mentioned Haas that you don't know if the bitcoins are there at grayscale or not. Let, let's just say they have X amount of bitcoins that they claim they have for customers, and and you said that you don't know if they actually have X amount or not. You know, just so you guys know that are listening to this, guys, in order for you to be a custodian, like to qualify as a custodian, which means that you are holding coins or money or gold or any asset on behalf of the customer, there are certain filing and there's certain reporting laws and there's certain auditing laws that you have to follow. For example, you have to hire an outside auditor to come in and audit your assets. For example, I think that they use, I just did a quick search. That no, I, I agree with all of that. The, the, I agree you know, with the, all of that in theory. 
But like when has a bank ever followed like laws and regulations? Like every single like day we read about a, a bank getting fined for money laundering or not yeah, yeah. Uh, not complying with compliance laws. Like it's it's too easy to do. Well, we're, we're comparing two different things here, guys. We're, we're, we're comparing the small, minute amount. You know how many thousands and millions of banks there are in the world that comply with the law? Just because there's one or two, you know, banks or a small number of banks that don't comply with the law and do something illegal, right? We, we can't cast that doubt on everyone. That's just like, you know, like that's like saying, you know, one or two bad cops. And we, we, we tell say that millions of cops in America are bad or around the world are bad. I, 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 I don't subscribe to that type of, of you know, attributing a, what a small minority of people or businesses do to the whole majority. OK, no, so totally agree. Totally agree. But we are talking about the guy that authored the Segwit 2X defense. So like there's there's reason there's great reason for like Bitcoiners to be skeptical of these people. Like they don't really have a, a good history of like ethical, moral behavior. OK, so 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 you're combining your personal moral and ethical, you know, mindset onto a business that pays a large sum of money for outside auditors to come in and audit them. Now, if, if, if you looked at their audit report and you said, Ty, you know, I disagree with this audit. It says that they have X amount of coins. There's only so many uh, uh, print minted each day by the Bitcoin network. And there's a, I don't see how they could have achieved this. I want more clarity on this. And you look at their audit report and you say that, you know, m maybe I can agree with it. But to say that an American company that is following the laws in the US that's paying large sums of money to get audited, you know, on a regular basis so that they can comply with U.S. laws to say that they're a fraud or that they're fishy or something like that. I, I've been accused of things that I didn't do before and I had to go to prison for it. My brother has been accused of, you know, crimes that he did not do and he has spent the majority of his life in it before. So I am very cautious when I point the finger and accuse somebody, you know, like when I accuse somebody, I clearly state the laws that they're breaking. OK, and sometimes there'll be people online. I hate their guts. I hate their guts. <laughs> I think they're piece, you know, a POS. I got to keep it 13, a PG-13. I hate them. In person, I probably slap the crap out of them. OK, I probably, if they come to Vietnam, you know, I probably beat the hell out of them just because I don't like them. OK, but just because I don't like them doesn't mean I go online and accuse them of being a fraud or a scammer. They have to break a law in the country they're in. The, the, in the jurisdiction they're in before I open my mouth and say that, hey, that guy's a fraud or that guy. Like Richard Hex, I mean, Richard Wynn, that's just, to me, he's breaking SEC laws very blatantly. He doesn't think he is, but with that Hex crypto, that, that BS crypto that he, he's releasing to everybody and he's raising money for it, he thinks he's not. I'm calling him out right now. I've been calling him out all over, but I'll go on video to say, and I'll be one to, to, to show you what laws he's violating. So he's violating U.S. SEC laws because he's in the U.S. jurisdiction. That I will say, but I'm not just going to go up there and randomly just say that this, just because I don't like somebody doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong. All right, all right. We, we, we've, we've, uh, we've stretched out GBTC to a point where we're talking about uh, you know who. So let's, let's I, I would I would move on. Uh, we, did, we did speak of uh, custodial uh, aspects of, of GBTC and uh, – and protest of, uh, of of Coinbase. So I want to tie it all in here because uh, J.W. Weatherman has a very interesting tweet that uh, Hass and I were talking about beforehand. Uh, how about a protest where we all provably lock up $10 of Bitcoin per month for 10 years? Uh, what do you think about that one, Hass? Uh... Like I was telling you earlier, uh, OPSEC, OPSEC nightmare, uh, because uh, $10 doesn't sound like a lot, but the, the true believers know that if you do lock it up for 10 years, uh, it, 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 is a, it is a target uh, on your back. And uh, everyone, everyone knows me, you know, uh, how religious and spiritual I am about Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, your, your religion should be kept your religion and charity and donations should be kept private. So uh, just make a personal commitment uh, to lock up this money and save, not for anyone else's benefit, uh, uh, but your own. Uh, but at the same time, by locking up this money, 
uh, you are you are effectively uh, you are you are uh, committing the greatest act of charity uh, humanity has ever known. So uh, what I mean by that is if you if you want to if you want to save like the trees or like the animals, uh, like you donate to Greenpeace. Like, uh, you know, if you want to, like, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, help with blood donations or whatever, like you donate uh, to the Red Cross, who do you donate to, to to fix the money? Which is arguably the only worthy cause uh, in the world. Uh, you just donate to Bitcoin. The only charity or the second charity in history uh, where you uh, where you can donate and have an impact and and become enriched off the back of your donations. Well, I'll say this: uh, people are are saying that Bitcoin is the true protest, and I think what JW might be going toward here is that uh, everyone can talk a big game, like yeah, I bought Bitcoin and I protested. But if there was like a place where everyone could see all the protesters that did it every single month. And and you see, this is the the opsec I- issue here and everything. I mean, uh, not, not just n- that the traders would love it. They could just start. Uh, there's all the indicators laid out uh, on paper in front of them, which they could trade against. Mm. Uh, so it's just, about, uh, uh, it's just... linear trap. What do you think about Bitcoin as a protest uh, <laughs> and this uh, very public version of it? I, guess. Uh, I I agree with Has for sure. Um, I think creating this big honey pot of money. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of like almost. It would be a show, to be honest, um, and it's it's still against everything Bitcoin is is about. It's decentralized. So, what is the point of putting all this money into a pot? And how do you even decide how it ever gets used? I mean that that you're going to cause more problems than you're solving, to be honest. Well, okay. Uh, all right. It, it's, 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 it probably lock up $10 of Bitcoin per month. I mean, it wouldn't be to, it'd be your own personal pot, but then people would know it was your personal pot. Uh, it, it, it would just, it would just, any, it's a statement, a visual statement against, uh, inflation. I, I, I'll say that, uh, that that's a nice way of putting it. Well, let, let's talk about protests real quick with, uh, uh, with Tizen. Tizen, I, I don't know if you saw, but there was a guy at a, a, a Black Lives Matter protest saying that he was encouraging people to use Bitcoin. So what, what you were saying uh, before at the beginning of the show is that that's kind of a, I wouldn't, well, it, it shows the power of Bitcoin. The people that you probably disagree with on the Black Lives Matter thing, uh, they might get into Bitcoin and that'll be good for Bitcoin and no one can stop them from getting into Bitcoin. Uh, but what do you think about these uh, protests that have been going on? And uh, uh, did you see that clip of the guy talking about Bitcoin at one of the Black Lives Matter protests? Um, yes, I, I see. I saw the the, the black guy uh, talking through the megaphone about yes. Bitcoin, telling you know, the protesters to buy Bitcoin. You know, and yeah. to me, it's it's good. It's good that we have somebody talking about it to spread the word. But you know, it's it's also you got to do it at the right times and in the right place. You know, for people. You know, if I go to the middle of a World Cup soccer game and tell people to start buying Bitcoin, or I go to, you know, a Super Bowl game and, and talk about buying Bitcoins or to a UFC fight or something and tell people to buy Bitcoins, I don't think it's going to have a lot of effect simply because you, you're in the wrong environment and the people are not there. They're there to throw bricks at cops and throw bricks at people and stuff like that and protest. They're not there to... to, 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 to uh, to look for a financial way out. I, I believe this, you know, just like Adam, like you became financially free because of crypto, because of Bitcoin, and because I, my family became financially free. We're not enslaved into the system anymore. We're not stuck to the nine to five job anymore. I think that that's the best way that you beat the system. You want to beat the man, you want to beat the system, you, 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 you escape from the nine to five chain and go live the life that you want you and your family to live. You know, one of the things that that motivated me when I got out of prison, you know, after being in prison for nearly 14 years, when I came out, I realized that the people around me in society are in a prison. They're in a prison of a failed marriage. They're in a prison of a bad relationship. They're in a prison of drug addiction or alcohol addiction. They're in a prison where they're stuck in a corporate job where they're paying, they're paying just enough 
to where they can't leave. They, they get paid just enough to where, you know what, if I leave, it's just, oh man, it's not really worth it. So that's what they, in America, they call the golden handcuffs, right? And to me, that was a bigger prison than the one I was in when I was in federal prison, because at least I can see the steel bars and the steel doors and the razor wire that's keeping me in the prison. I know that once I get past these steel doors, I'm free. But the people that walk around every day, they walk around. There's no steel doors. There's no steel bars, man. And the worst prison that you can be in is where you're in a prison where it's invisible and you don't see it. You're stuck in that nine to five job. You waste 40 years of your life there. What? Just to come out, just to get Social Security, just to get a small, measly retirement income. The way you beat that is you escape that rat race. You escape that system and you go live the life that you want to live. Like what you're doing right now, Adam, or what I'm doing right now and many of our students and our team members are doing. That's how you beat the system, you know. And, and I, I wouldn't say that by I would say, you know, I would encourage people. To, to get some crypto, buy $10, $100, whatever you can afford, right? That, you know, don't starve your family, but whatever you can afford. And, you know, if, 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 if holding it for a year allows you to have the financial freedom that you want, uh, holding it for 10 years uh, gives it, you know, wh wh whatever it does, get yourself free of the current system that you're in. That's the best way to beat the system. And then you have the free time like myself and like Adam to go and, and you know, preach to other people and share our experiences with other people to help free them. You know, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I am financially free. I'm grateful that, you know, I learned how to do this stuff and share it with other people so they can become financially free. Cause I know that every person I help, they're going to help one or two people. And to me, that's the best way to, to, to get people free of the system that we're in right now. You know, Oh, wow. And inspirational thoughts from Tizen Pi. Pound that like button. Well, we're obviously at the end of the show right now. So I want everybody to, to give their uh, final thoughts, their conclusions, anything that was left off. Uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Linear Trav. I want to hear about your, uh, give us a little talk about 3D printing because you're into that. I, and this is the golden age. It's not just about uh, cryptocurrency in the 2020s. I think uh, 3D printing is huge also. No, that's true. I think, um, there's a lot of parallels between 3D printing and um, Bitcoin. And the last 10 years, just like Bitcoin has evolved, um, so has 3D printing. And I think the capabilities that, um, that are being built by small groups all around, um, it, the, it really is amazing. I mean, and you know, to tie in with the theme that we've had of censorship resistance, uh, permissionless and unconfiscatable, I think those th those um, lines of ethos are starting to bleed in the 3D printing community. I think um, you know things like 3D printed guns are it's they're fighting the same battles that they are with Bitcoin. I mean, code is free speech, whether that code is C++ for Bitcoin or you know G code, and um, they're fighting those battles line by line. Um, just like Bitcoin is moving every 10 minutes with a new block. Um, so we could talk about it and maybe some other time, Adam, all the, all the specifics, but you know, I, I think um, it really is the communities that are being built like, like Bitcoin are there in 3D printing. And I think um, there's a possibility of those ethos is coming together. And um, I'm just excited to see where that's going to go in the future and to be a part of it. So uh, thanks so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. Keep on being in motion, 3D printing motion. I, I, I love it. I love it. Uh, 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 since since you Tizen, the, gonna say something there? Yeah, yeah. Since, since you brought the 3D printing, man, I, I want to follow uh, behind uh, yeah. uh, uh, Mr. Trav there uh, with what he said. So th there's a website called reprap.org. Rep yep. like a representative and rap like hip hop rap.org. I highly recommend that you take a look at it because they offer like open source uh, 3D printing and they have a huge community that if, if you're like not financially, uh, um, uh, what do you call that? If you're financially challenged and you don't have enough money to buy your own 3D printer, the, the, the community is really supportive and they'll actually help you print your printer. I think that's like the baddest, like to me, I've never said this until you brought it up, Adam Meister, okay? But 
outside of crypto and blockchain technology, I think that the most revolutionary technology in the planet, in, in the universe right now, is 3D printing. Like, I don't care if my kids go to school or not, okay? I don't care about none of that. But I will get them some software and some hardware so they can all learn 3D printing right now, okay? As soon as they're capable of, you know, operating a, a, a computer and, and following instructions, that's like the first toy that I will get for my kids, okay? I, I came from a manufacturing background. Many of you guys, you know, if you've been following me for a long time, you know that I grew up, you know, as a machinist, a welder, and, you know, I used to build commercial fishing boats down uh, in the southeast Texas around the Houston area, you know, and I've worked on pretty much all the Vietnamese fishing boats down there and the shrimp boats down there in the Gulf Coast area. I, I, I promise you, I, I probably worked on about 90, 95% of all these boats there before 1993, okay, before I went to prison, okay? And when I came out of prison, when I saw what 3D printing was, man, I was up for hours. Like, there's only been a couple of things in my life one was like reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad and reading The Unlimited Power uh, by Tony Robbins, realizing that, hey, if I change my mindset, I can create the life that I want to live. Number two is probably uh, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And then number three would probably be 3D printing that, in that order right there. You know what I'm saying? And I, I'm telling you guys, the, 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 what I plan on doing is after the crypto boom is over and it starts to become stable, just like the traditional stock market and the Forex market and stuff, I will be devoting all my time, effort, and resources into uh, 3D printing. You know, one of my goals was to set up like a, um, like a, uh, like a nonprofit, like, uh, what do you call that, like trade school in Vietnam, just to help out the Vietnamese community and, and get them educated uh, about 3D printing because I believe that levels the playing field. That, that, that 3D printing, you know, took away, like, in the old days, you had that big, you know, lays, milling machines, all kinds of really heavy industrial equipment just to manufacture stuff. And nowadays, you can prototype, in, if you have a plan to invent new things, right, you can prototype and make a prototype with these 3D printers before you take it to market. And I believe that that just levels the playing field for the poor communities, the poor countries, and the countries that don't have adequate, you know, industrial equipment to manufacture and do all this stuff. So I, I, I'm looking forward to doing that. You know, I'll be happy to stay in touch with you, uh, Linear Trav, yeah. you know, and maybe Definitely. when I get that set up, you know, bring you over and, and educate some of our Vietnamese young, you know, engineers and, and, and young people uh, to the art of 3D printing, because I think that that to me is a game changer. And I actually put it on almost the same level as blockchain, as Bitcoin. I, I, I really do put that almost up there at the same level. Golden you know? age in, in motion here. We're making connections. This is unbelievable. I love it. I love the positivity because, you know, in the world today, we keep on hearing about destruction, people tearing things down. People are jealous of other people. Uh, there's disease. There's death. There's this, that. But look, at this is reality. This is the golden age. This is what's going to change the world. The new stuff, the cryptocurrency, the freaking 3D printing. All right. Hasma Cook, what are your conclusionary thoughts? Uh, I'd say uh, I'd tell everyone to uh, uh, stand up for what you believe in. Believe in something. If you don't believe in anything, believe in Bitcoin at least. Uh, save, save yourself. Stack those sets. And uh, uh, you know, with uh, with every with every sat you lock up, uh, Bitcoin becomes more and more stable. And the more and more stable it is, uh, the more and more uh, it can it can truly help uh, the unbanked. So, uh, just like uh, rich people buying the Tesla Model S made the Tesla Model Three possible, uh, rich people stacking stats, sats is what it's going to take uh, to get this baby big and stable enough. Uh, to help out the unbanked, so uh, so do, dig deep, do your part, give to this Bitcoin charity, and uh, <laughs> it's like playing playing life on cheat codes. It's only the second charity in history where you donate and you become rich. Excellent point. Thank you uh, for returning to the show. It's late at night in Australia. You'll get some uh, a good night's sleep tonight, no doubt. Now uh, we'll we'll end it with. Uh, Ties in with his uh, conclusionary thoughts. Anything he wanted to add, and uh, he did bring up he did bring up one thing. I wanted him to, to just give me an opinion on. You brought up rich dad, uh, poor dad, and uh, 
the guy who wrote that, uh, Kaius Kiyosaki, whatever the way you pronounce his name, lately he's been saying, and I quote, I love Bitcoin. Have you heard about that? Yes, and I do respect uh, uh, um, Robert Kiyosaki, you know. He's, he's one of the most influential people in my life, you know, that, that you know, I can, you know, conclusively say that his book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that's it, made me quit college for good. And that's the book that made me, you know, not put my kids uh, in college also, you know, because in order for them, the only reason to go to college is to make money, guys. Let's just be real about it, okay? We're not there you know, to be well-rounded. If you want to be well-rounded, go be well-rounded on your own. You don't need to pay $25,000 a year or $50,000 a year to be well-rounded. You can easily learn how to do that, you know, just by hanging around the right people, all right? So, it, well, what I want to wrap up with is if, if you guys watch this, you guys will notice that, you know, you guys know that Adam and, and I have different views about Bitcoin, you know? Um, Leonard Trav and I have different views about Bitcoin, okay? But one of the things that, that, that I recommend to people is that don't let your personal views and opinions about one topic cause you to lose out on opportunities that you can meet with other people. Like, you know, I, I don't let, you know, like, I, it's obvious that Linear, Trav, and I have different views about Bitcoin, about Coinbase, and, you know, maybe Grace, a lot of things, you know. But you know what? He and I can still come to terms on 3D printing, right? He might have some amazing knowledge. He might have some revolutionary ideas about 3D printing that I've never seen or heard of, okay? So don't don't be so closed-minded, right? Yeah, you can have strong opinions about something, but don't, you know, be, be prepared that, hey, you know, if somebody has some ideas or something that, hey, you know what, I, you know, that could possibly work or that's a good idea or something, don't let your personal opinions about one, one issue derail you from not seeing that in someone else. I don't know if I'm explaining that clearly. If you guys want to add to that, you know, no, but that's no. what I encourage people to do during this bear market, during this, this coronavirus crash and all this other stuff. One of the biggest things that you can do besides, you know, getting crypto, Bitcoin, whatever that you like, right? Like, like Adam and, 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 and everyone on this panel is, is saying is that one of the, the most important things that you can do in life is to network and connect with other people that provide value. You know, that, that's that's one of the biggest things. Like, you know, go out there, go to meetups. Don't let this social distance and all this crap, uh, this hoax that, that the, the, the mainstream media has created prevent you from going out there and meet real human beings, guys, right? You go out there, right? I, I attribute my wealth, my success, my financial freedom to all the people that I have met in life and I have networked with, become friends with, and appreciate what they do. That is one of the most important things that you can do Second to, you know, getting some crypto into your portfolio. Go out there, meet people, connect with people, find people that do things that you like and connect with them, get to know them, spend some time with them, invite them out for a coffee, invite them, you know, to go do things like real human beings do. Don't just tweet to them. Don't just chat with them online. Create real human relationships. And that's going to pay off in the end. Okay. All right. In motion is what we say around here. Be in motion. Don't be a tree. Get out there. Network. Tie, tie is on this stuff. And these oper this, it's always an opportunity when people are talking. Even It's exactly what he said. You don't agree on everything, but you could find something that, that you do find. It, I mean, you don't know what a new relationship will blossom. So I love these shows. I love bringing different types of people together like this. And this, this is what it's all about, being in motion. Okay, dudes. We do this Every single Friday, you never know what time it's going to be on. You never know who's going to be on, but it's uh, the best freaking guest in the space. I'm Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, this Rob Meister. Subscribe to this backup channel. Uh, pound that like button. Bang that bell button. Shabbat Shalom, as we say. Uh, tomorrow, you'll get, another, you'll get Beyond Bitcoin because we do a new show here every day. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, Thanks for having you tomorrow. Me. Thanks a bunch. Thanks for having us. See you next week. Dudes, you're